Well, uh, again, good morning. It's uh, great to see everybody here today. And, you know, it's, it's nice to be together with the church family and, and just be encouraged, even just by your presence. And um, every day, it seems like something new comes up that just kind of, <laughs> you know, you scratch your head or it upsets you or angers you or rattles your cage. We live in crazy times. The good news is they can get crazier and probably will. Um, and uh, I don't know how many of us find ourselves just uh, fretting a little bit sometimes or even panicking or being anxious. And it's, it's hard to not fall into that. And yet uh, God is still on the throne. We're going to say that every Sunday until he's not. So guess what? <laughs> it's going to be a while. It's an important reminder, truly, that he is on his throne. All righty, so we've been going through these exhibits of how biblical Christianity is being attacked, whether it's the creation account, life itself, gender issues, marriage and family, humanity, our very being. And when it comes to humanity, we talked about the fact that, I mean, look, the real easy thing is just to read God's word, study it, know it, and apply it. There you go. Simple. That's all you need to do. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, we're reminded by the author there that uh, of what we already knew in Genesis, that we're created in God's image. And when we understand that we're created in God's image, well, first of all, you have to acknowledge there's a God. Uh, and if you do, then we're accountable to him. And if we're created in his image, that says some really important things about us. First of all, if you feel like you're inadequate, you are <laughs> without him. Um, and if you feel like you can't do enough, well, you can't. So that's where he steps in. If you read the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, it's, it's a funny little book because uh, there were individuals over centuries, in the centuries past, that didn't think that Ecclesiastes should be included in Scripture, uh, in partly because it's depressing, um, or at least people feel that it's depressing. But if you read Ecclesiastes and think it's depressing, you haven't read the end of the book. Because what is Solomon doing? He's looking back on his life and saying, you know what, I've tried everything. <laughs> this is the wisest man on the planet, and he had tried everything, and what he found was what? Life was pointless without God. And we live in a world of people who are living without God, and that is why they have lost hope. That is why the suicide rates have skyrocketed, drug abuse, sexual promiscuity, all these things have skyrocketed because people have no hope. And if they're not hearing about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ from us, then where are they going to hear it from? And so, especially if, you've, if you're a more seasoned individual, the temptation is to just say, you know what, the world's going to heck in a handbasket, so let's just let God do his thing. And, but we're commanded to continue to proclaim the good news of the gospel. Whether you're two years old, 20 years old, 92 years old is immaterial. It's irrelevant. God has a purpose for your life right now. And your purpose is to glorify him. And part of that is proclaiming the good news. We've got the, we've got the hope in us. And our lives need to share that. And it's especially hard with people on TV hurling insults at each other and tweeting ridiculous things and outright lying but God is still on his throne. And I have to be reminded of that daily. Well, before we uh, continue, let's go ahead and have a quick word of prayer. Father God, thank you that you are in control, that you are sovereign, you are the ultimate authority in the universe, you're all powerful, you're almighty, you're all knowing. You're everywhere. God, thank you that you are present here this morning. Thank you that we don't have to invite you. You're here. And God, that should give us comfort and encouragement. It also should give us a healthy fear <laughs> if where there are areas in our lives that are not right with you. Lord, help us not to run from you, but rather to run 
towards you, knowing that actually you, you're constantly pursuing us. You pursued us before we came to you before Christ, and you continue to chase after us. Why? Because you love us. Why? Because you want to have a relationship with us. Thank you for that relationship and for making it possible through your son, Jesus Christ. Be with us this morning as we hear from your word and listen to other sources that are counter to your word. But Lord, help us to have things in perspective and continually be reminded of who you are. And we've read the end of the book. You win. And that's all that should matter to us. So we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Acts chapter, chapter 17, just kind of to review uh, the whole idea of, you know, we are one race, the human race. And if the Old Testament isn't enough to prove that, then Luke reminds us in the Acts of the Apostles, verse 26, and he, God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should see God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Oh, that answers another, it's not as hot of a topic right now, but it has been in pol the political world, and that is borders. God established borders. <laughs> oh, there it is, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling. Um, God is even in charge of that. God's in charge of the map. And he puts nations in power and he removes them from power. And he puts kings and queens on the throne and he removes them. If President Trump wins re-election, it's because God wanted him to win re-election. If Joe Biden wins the election, it's because God wanted Joe Biden to win the election. And whatever your opinion is on that, doesn't matter. This may shock you, but God does not care about your opinion. What he does care about is your heart. Does your heart line up with him? The rest of the stuff doesn't really matter. We know that God does not play favorites, except that he plays favorites. So that sounds like a little bit of a, you know, oxymoron, but Peter opened his mouth. I love that phrase. It's not always good when Peter opens his mouth or pulls out his sword hand, but... Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So it's the basic principle is that your skin color, the shape of your nose, the money in your wallet or lack of money in your wallet isn't the issue. The issue is, do you know him and do you serve him? Beyond that, I don't care what you look like. Some of you are beautiful people. Some of you are beautiful people inside. <laughs> and then, of course, we know James and his words on partiality. But the reason we, we were getting into this is that two weeks ago when we, when we last covered it, it was this whole idea of uh, critical race theory and intersectionality. By the way, if you have to come up with some complicated buzzword, it's because you're trying to sell fertilizer to somebody, but make it smell like a cinnamon roll. Now, I don't know from personal experience, but I'm going to go out on a limb that road apples and that's manure and cinnamon rolls don't taste the same. And yet there's a whole lot of people shoving a, shoveling a whole lot of stuff Doo-doo, we can say doo-doo in church. We can go King James, dung. God has such an amazing sense of humor that he even made a dung beetle. Do you bring up the dung beetle in your talks ever? I don't think so. You should, Chris. The dung beetle is, is a fascinating example of God's creation. I mean, here's a little beetle that makes dung balls. You think snowball fights are bad. <laughs> but critical race theory, intersectionality, why on earth did we ever get to this point? Because of two things. One, the world as a whole denied God and continues to deny, to deny God. God as creator. 
And secondly, because the church did the same thing. They either have bought into it or kind of in Romans 1, it talks about sort of that tacit approval. If you don't know what tacit approval is, it's basically when something bad is going on and I do nothing to stop it. And God says, you're guilty. You're, you're just as responsible because you didn't do anything to stop it. In fact, in some states, you have laws that prohibit that. So, you know, if you see something illegal, you're in some states. I don't know if Washington State has that. Do you know? I look at my legal team here. <laughs> But uh, there are some states that have these laws. Good Samaritan laws are called sometimes where if you see something going wrong and you don't do anything about it, you can be prosecuted. So, but regardless of what the law says, God says if you see something wrong. In fact, he, he doesn't just say illegal. He says if you see you know, a fellow brother, like in Galatians 6, if you see a fellow brother in sin, you who are spiritual come alongside them and you help them out. Now, notice it says, come alongside. It doesn't say, beat him over the head with a hammer. And it also says, you're, you need to be spiritual. One, it doesn't mean you need to be perfect or, you know, any of that kind of thing. It's make sure that you help people that are not going to drag you down. And some of you have helped folks, and it might even be family members, and it's black hole ministry. It doesn't matter how much you pour into it. It's never enough. And I think at some point you, you have to just cut that off um, because they're dragging you down and you need to be strong. So, for example, uh, um, if alcoholism is your issue, if that's your uh, a problem or struggle with you, guess what? You, if you're still struggling with that, you're probably not the person to help a fellow alcoholic because they'll drag you down. So you, you have to be in a spot where, you know, if, if Mike has a, uh, he's on QVC all the time and Home Shopping Network, this guy just orders, I have no idea, I'm making stuff up. Wouldn't be funny if it were true and somewhat embarrassing. What, do you know, do we, what, can you list your grandfather's sins for me real quickly? Never mind. So, <laughs> whoa, we almost had something there. It's like, <laughs> what, well, as a matter of fact, the pastor, I have a list. <laughs> Mike, you look a little nervous there, buddy. <laughs> I'll buy you candy. Um, but, uh, you know, all right, so let's say Mike has a, a, he's a compulsive shopper. You know, again, I don't know that this is true. Um, but if I'm a compulsive shopper, then I'm probably not the one to help him. Does that make sense? Now, maybe that was my problem in the past, but I've been, you know, I haven't used my, my, QVC account for the last five years, so I'm doing pretty well. Then, then I've got shared experience, and so I might be one to help him out. But um, if your baggage is the same as the other person, then it's not a good idea to go on the, a trip together. That was uh, from the great philosopher. No one ever said that. So, we're, oh my goodness, I'm getting off track here today. I need some tea. Back to the basic principle. If we don't have God in our life, we will buy into the most ridiculous schemes. So this is a clip from uh, Prager University. Now, Dennis Prager, some of you are familiar with him. Um, he's, I don't know how uh, strong of a Jew he is, but he's Jewish by uh, faith. And... Um, but he has this Prager University. Some people have said, well, it's not a real university. Well, it was never purported to be a real university. It's just, um, and you know it's got to be good stuff because YouTube has banned a bunch of their videos. Um, so I say that's a seal of approval right there. But this one is um, going to speak about the whole concept of white privilege. In fact, there is a, uh, an author who came out with a book called White Fragility. Now, what's interesting about the author of this book is that she is white, okay, but uh, this whole thing of white fragility, it, it's this, this, this reasoning where you kind of get pigeonholed. It's like, it doesn't matter what you do, what you say, if you're white, you're racist, there's no way around it. Well, that's just goofy. And I want to use a stronger word, but um, it's, it's just moronic thinking. Um, 
Anyway, so here's an individual from Prager University. Um, now you might notice that this guy has a little bit more melanin in his skin than I do. 99% of the world has more melanin in their skin than I do. Um, but anyway, we'll, uh, hopefully our audio will work as we listen to what he says about white privilege. I'd like to ask you a favor. Please stop asking for forgiveness for your white privilege. You're not fooling anybody. You're not helping black people or any other minority. And your public confessions don't make you look virtuous. They make you look disingenuous, which is a really nice way of saying fake, phony, and fraudulent. For starters, what is white privilege anyway? Because you're born with white skin, you have all these advantages that I don't have? Like what? Like you can get a mortgage loan that I can't get? Hmm, I got a loan at a great rate, by the way, and I got the house. Why would a banker not give a loan to someone who met the loan requirements? He doesn't want to make money? I've never heard of such a banker. Or how about this? You can enter a store and not be looked upon with suspicion, but I, a black person, cannot? Except that has never happened to me. But if I was a young dude with my pants hanging down to my butt, I could understand why the store owner would be concerned. I used to be a cop. Believe me, I understand. If I owned the store, I'd be tracking that kid too, whether he was black, white, or anything else. Or what if I had a store that had a history of being shoplifted by young black women and a young black woman with a bad attitude walked in? Would I be suspicious? Yeah, I would. Who wouldn't? I call that common sense, not bigotry. But there's another way of looking at this. In many ways, in today's America, blacks have more privilege than whites. It's been my experience that whites bent over backwards to give blacks every possible advantage. If two people are equally qualified for a job, the black person will usually get it. Big companies and prestigious universities fall all over one another trying to sign up talented black people. If you deny this, you are denying reality, which is what the person who dreamed up this whole thing did. A professor of women's studies at Wellesley College by the name of Peggy McIntosh. She wrote in an article in 1988 about all the white privilege she thought she had. She listed 46, including this one. I can choose bandages and flesh color and have them more or less match my skin. Wow, that's some kind of privilege. Soon others took up the cause. Today, these so-called progressives dominate our colleges and universities, imposing this absurd notion of white privilege on their students. That's too bad because it does nothing good for white students and it does nothing good for black students. But of the two, ironically, the white students get the better of the deal. Let me explain. To acknowledge your white privilege is supposed to make you feel bad. Only it doesn't. It makes you feel good because by acknowledging your white privilege, you're declaring yourself to be enlightened. And as a virtue bonus, it also makes you a better person than those whites who don't acknowledge their privilege. White privilege, which is supposed to make you feel bad, ends up making you feel good. Meanwhile, the real damage is to blacks. What makes whites feel good makes blacks angry. More than 50 years after the civil rights movement, the message is, you're still oppressed. How can this not create a victim mentality? And anyone of any color who sees himself as a victim gets angry. Now, I wouldn't deny for a second that there are privileges in life. They're all over the place. There's two-parent family privilege. That's huge. There's being lucky to be born in America privilege. There's good gene privilege. But white privilege? Doesn't it depend on the person? Let's take this for example. A black lawyer and his wife have a baby and a meth addict, single white woman, has a baby. Which kid has privilege? The white one? Because he's white? Come on now. <laughs> and here's the kicker. Even if it were true, all those claims about white privilege, so what? Would it change a single thing I did? If white people apologize for being white, is that supposed to help me? In what way? So let's be real. White privilege is an attempt by the left to divide Americans by race. It's all theory and all nonsense. 
If you want to file for it, go ahead. It's a free country. But don't try to sell it to me. I'm an American who deal with my fellow Americans one-on-one. -on -one. Try it. It works. I'm Brandon Tatum for Prager University. <laughs> so I like Brandon Tatum. He's a no-nonsense kind of guy. And obviously he's not ignoring the you know, issues that we do have uh, in our country for sure, but uh, I think he shows just a very reasoned approach that uh, this idea of white privilege is uh, made up by a white person. Anyway, we spoke briefly about, uh, some, well, a little bit, about Black Lives Matter and their logo change, because this kind of gives rise to, you know, where did, where did some of this thinking come from and when, why, is it, why is it out there? We looked at their old logo and then how it compares to one of the ones that was used by the Soviet Union. Um, so we have one other clip because, I, and I, again, I don't like doing a lot of clips, but I think it's important to get this information and to see, you know, what a biblical perspective is from this. Uh, I don't remember this individual's uh, name, but this particular uh, gentleman. So this is a, um, and, and you may have seen this, the whole Black Lives Matter movement, you do understand Black Lives Matter is not an organization. Now they're organized, but there's no, you know, official organization or charity or nonprofit or anything like that. And so there is the movement, but where did it come from? It was founded by three women. Um, and uh, so this individual here, this is a talk show. Now he's, this guy is a radical um, dude and um, I, this is where I was like, okay, I don't think there's any language issues in there. I'm pretty sure there's not. Um, as far as anything offensive in the sense of profanity, now there's some thoughts that may be offensive, but he's interviewing one of the three founders of Black Lives Matter. Um, so you can get a perspective of, of where did this movement, how did it start, why did it start? Remember when I read a couple weeks ago from kind of their manifesto, and there was, I didn't read all of it, but there was a real emphasis on cisgender, transgender, LGBTQ, LMNRP, whatever, um, and this will explain why that is there. So um, I think this is the only other clip I have today. I don't like doing tons of clips, but. How do you respond to that particular critique? Ladder, ladder, ladder. A loving critique from an elder of the struggle uh, that some others share, uh, that I've even shared as well, uh, to, to be frank, as a concern about, uh, in part because of the co-optation and, and the appropriation, that, that a, a more clear ideological um, structuring might be of some value here. But how do you respond to, to, to those kinds of, uh, again, loving criticisms? Um, I think huh? that the criticism is helpful. Um, I also think that it might, um, I think of a lot of things. The first thing I think is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Um, we are uh, super... Uh, versed um, on sort of ideological theories. And I think that what we really try to do is build a movement that could be utilized by many, many black folk. Um, we don't necessarily want to be the vanguard um, of this movement. I think we've tried to put out a political frame that's about um, centering who we think are the most vulnerable amongst the black community to really fight for all of our lives. Um, and I do think that we have some clear direction around where we want to take this movement. I don't believe it's going to fizzle out. It just gets stronger and we see it, right? We've seen it after Sandra Bland. We saw, we're seeing it now with the interruption of the Netroots Nation Presidential Forum. Um, what I do think though is folks, um, especially um, folks who've been trained in a particular way, want to hear um, certain things from us that, we, that we're, we're not sort of framing it in, in the same ways that maybe another generation have has, but I think it's important that people know that we are, um, this, this, 
the Black Lives Matter movement doesn't just live online, um, although there's many people who utilize it online. Uh, we're in a different uh, set of circumstances, a different generation that social media um, may feel like it's diluting so it's the, the larger ideological frame, but I, I argue that it, it's not. So one part where she talks about yeah, trained Marxists. Didn't know that was a thing. Um, not going to get any Marxist training. But uh, yeah, so two of the three founders, uh, lesbians, um, she uses the Q word, but, um, and so it gives you an idea of where their real and original intent was to help that part of the black community. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's not a surprise that there's a Marxist foundation. This is a cover you can see from The Economist, the rise of millennial socialism. Um, we're going to use the word socialism and Marxism somewhat interchangeably. Why? Because they're somewhat interchangeable. <laughs> so um, this Marxist thought. And millennials, a recent survey said that 70% of millennials would vote for a socialist. And it's not because they're, these are stupid individuals, it's because they're uneducated individuals. They're just ignorant. They don't know what socialism, what Marxism is. So let's say it very clear at this church that it is completely anti-biblical, anti-God, anti-Christian in every shape and form because at its core, it has to deny God. In 1993, I, as some of you remember, because you supported me, I went on a missions trip to the former Soviet Union, uh, to Russia, and to Belarus. Belarus, it makes it in the news every once, makes it gets in the news every once in a while. But it's still a communist country. Uh, it doesn't care what label you put on it. Belarus never, never became a free country. Um, in fact, the missionaries that were over there, they're they're not there any longer, um, in part because. Uh, Belarus has been so hostile to religion. And, uh, and then you also have the Russian Orthodox Church that is very hostile to any religion other than themselves. They were one of the biggest threats. So I was able to go there um, during the short window of time when they were allowing Westerners to, to be there. A week after I left, uh, the Bible Institute that the missionaries there had set up was raided by the KGB. Wait a minute, the KGB was gone because communism was over. Yeah, no. And they harassed and even assaulted uh, the teachers. And they were doing, they were sc uh, screen printing t-shirts as a way to make money for the Bible Institute. And so the KGB took knives and gashed, slashed all of the screens. Uh, broke the equipment up. Um, even when we were doing church services on Sundays, we, we were not allowed to call it a church service. We could call it a Bible study, oddly enough, but we weren't allowed to call it a church service. Eh. So it was nothing like a church service. We opened in prayer. We sang some hymns. Uh, we read from the Bible and preached a sermon, closed in prayer, but it wasn't a church service. Um, but we need to take a look a, a little bit at Marxism. Uh, some of you know Lee Edwards. He's a conservative historian, and he says there's a few key takeaways about socialism. First of all, he said socialism is no longer a parlor game for academics, but a political alternative taken seriously by millennials. Now, those of you who have been around have seen this shift where socialism's been around for a long time, but it was never, it was always on the fringe. It is not on the fringe at all. Um, and you've seen how uh, both political parties, main parties, but certainly the Democrat Party have have taken, just embraced wholeheartedly many of these socialistic principles. It is mainstream. Secondly, they don't recognize that much of what they, this is referring to millennials and those who subscribe to this, uh, much of what they enjoy in life is a result of capitalism and would disappear if socialism were to be implemented. Now, when I was in Belarus, this is, again, 1993, so it's just a few years after 
uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. And um, the economy was in shambles in Belarus. Now in Russia, a ruble, the dollar to ruble, uh, it was 2,500 rubles to an American dollar. In Belarus, which was a delightful 11 and a half hour train ride from Moscow, <laughs> on the old Soviet World War II era train, but it was a, fun, it was a great experience. I kept expecting, you know, Hercule Poirot to appear and um, solve a murder. Half of you got that, the other half will never know. They're Googling it right now. Um, but when I got to Belarus, the Belarusian ruble, it was 25,000 rubles to the dollar. Um, and I've shared many stories, you know, when I was teaching at the schools there, going to school one day, and the teacher was in tears. I just shared this not that long ago, but she was in tears because she said, we don't have lunch today. And so the kids, they had, she called it milk soup. I don't know what it was, but it was white, and there was something, it's like an oil slick on the top. Um, could have been <laughs> oil for all I know, but, um, but, but they, that's just how bad things were. Um, and so you would go to the store, which was owned by the government. Uh, there were no, no private enterprise. That, that was starting to happen a little bit, a little bit of private enterprise. But uh, you'd go to the government store, and if you wanted shoes, you had your choice between dress shoes or sneakers. And the quality was hideous. And I kid you not, you're talking like a store, or, you know, it would be like going to Nordstrom. And the, 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 the sneakers, the athletic shoes, they were just in a big pile, and you had to sort through and find two sizes, two shoes that would work for you. I mean, little things like that. Um, and the quality was just hideous. Um, it was, it's pretty amazing. And I could give lots of examples of, of that kind of thing. Thirdly, this is the reality of socialism, a pseudo-religion grounded in pseudo-science and enforced by political tyranny. This used to be something that was Eastern Bloc. It's now United States. And it does seem very strange that we are embracing it and not rejecting it. So where did all of this get its start? Well. It started before 1917, but here's a picture you can see there. Bolshevik fighters, they're posing with a captured vehicle in Petrograd, November 7th. So we're coming up to the anniversary of the so-called Russian Revolution or the Soviet, the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, so Marxism, now uh, Marx, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense that uh, it's named after him. Uh, he's not the only character though that we have. Uh, Marx was born in what was Prussia at the time, it's now uh, Germany, and uh, Marx and his buddy Friedrich Engels, um, they got together and came up with, uh, they wrote several books, but they were in England and they noticed that their, the working conditions post, you know, like this is with the Industrial Revolution and all the rest of it, and working conditions were hideous and horrible in the factories, and so it's one of those things where they uh, identified a legitimate concern and problem, but their response to it, uh, their solution to it was, was hideous, and we're still paying the price for it. Um, started with this little booklet here, The Condition of the Working Class in England. Uh, it was published in German. In fact, it actually was uh, an illegal booklet and was sort of, you know, and look, when the, these theories first came out, they were not popular, they were obscure. And uh, it took some time before they became a little bit more uh, known. So then, of course, you, the Communist Manifesto, which was only 23 pages long, but that little 23-page booklet uh, changed world history. Here's the only surviving original uh, draft from the Communist Manifesto. Um, Luis was watching me put this on the computer yesterday, and he's like, wow, I thought I had bad handwriting. It's like, <laughs> So anyway, well, you share that with, with Karl Marx, isn't that a pleasant connection? Um, so it really didn't gain popularity until after 1872. Um, and what's really interesting is, of course, they are railing against the rich and the elites, and yet they both became rich 
elites. Uh, Engels was already wealthy. He had a textile mill. So it's interesting, he was a businessman, he was a capitalist, um, and yet he's railing against the evil capital capitalists. Uh, Marx wasn't a, r a wealthy guy, but became one. Um, so that was a nice little bonus for his evilness. Um, so here's some words from Marx, because why wouldn't we quote Marx in church? In the social production, by the way, this is going to just make your head spin if you've never read this kind of stuff, so it may not make a whole lot of sense. But this is what is called double speak. You're hearing it. Can I just give an example from politics? Packing the Supreme Court. <laughs> it means one thing, adding judges to the Supreme Court. And yet, we have a party that's saying, oh, what the Republicans are doing is packing the Supreme Court. No, just because you call something something doesn't make it something, if it isn't that something. You, you want to write that down? That's an amazing quote. <laughs> People will be needle pointing that into pillows and for years to come. Um, where does this double speak, by the way? Uh, I wonder if somebody ever wrote a book. We've referenced this before, but if you have never read 1984, this is what's going on in 2020. Orwell was just off a few years. <laughs> but even the very, it's on the back cover, but um, if you want to read the actual source, it's from page four. And uh, I can't get it, but the Ministry of Truth, uh, which is a main character, if you will, in here. And they have what they call new speak, and it's the official language of Oceana. Um, and here it is, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. And that was the mantra that was repeated at, over and over and over again. We've, we quoted this from, you know, again, why, we've done Marx, why not Hitler? Um, remember what, what Hitler said, we just talked about this a few weeks ago. Hitler said, if you tell a lie often enough, people will begin to believe it. And it's true. That is why we need to study the truth, so that we can spot the lie. Here's a lie. Mark said this, in the social production that men carry on, they enter into definite relations that are indispensable and independent of their will, relations of production which correspond to a definite stage of development of their material forces of production. Yeah. I'm thinking of turning this into a praise and worship song, because this is amazing. This is very lyrical. I feel better about myself already. The sum total of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society, the real foundation on which rises a legal and political superstructure. Now, this is really key, because what Marx was saying is that the worker is everything. And the only way that you can lift up the worker is you have to have a political superstructure in place. Well, what was his definition of a, or his idea? How did that materialize? In a dictatorship. A legal and political superstructure and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. The mode of production in material life determines the general character of the social, political, and intellectual processes of life. It is not the consciousness of men which determines their existence. It is, on the contrary, their social existence which determines their consciousness. Yeah, I mean, it's, huh? So, again, it's, it's all about what you produce as an individual that makes you an individual, that gives you worth. What does God tell us? He says, you have value because I say you have value. And God goes further than that, does he not? He doesn't just say, you have value. He says, I'm going to become one of you and die on a cross for you. So how much are you worth? Jesus. That's the worth, that's the value that you have. And when we can grasp that, when we can cling to that, man, it, it just, then the, the cancer diagnosis, the employment issues, the relationship issues, the whatever you're going through, it's like, you know what? This still stinks, but I can get through it because I have value 
not because of my work, but because of his work and because God says I do. I'm not going to bash people intentionally, but this is where we see Marxism has, has, crept, has crept in. It, it's not crept in, it's there. I mean, it's not, it used to be sneaking in here and there and a little bit of, no, forget little doses, it's just outright blatant. Um, I'm not pinning this all on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, but here's a bartender who becomes one of the most powerful individuals in the country. Wow. Um, she got elected to the U.S. House of Representatives a few years back. And what scares me the most about her is a really deadly combination, arrogance and ignorance. Now, I'm not saying she's an idiot. I'm saying she's ignorant and at the same time arrogant. And that means that she's going to spout idiotic things. Um, she went on a little bit of a rant in July about religion. And I'll read some of it here. Well, one statement she said is that all people... Now, this is in the context of, uh, of what she referred to as LGBTQ rights. And she got on a preachy tirade uh, saying that all people are holy and all people are sacred. Now, we know from Scripture that that's not true. What does Scripture say about us? Yeah, we're depraved. The heart is, is wicked, desperately wicked and deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can comprehend it? We... All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, and that's what we teach here as a church, that we, we are born with a sin nature, which means we're disgusting, despicable individuals. And we needed a wonderful, righteous, loving God to remedy that. And he did through Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. Now, you might think, well, that's fine for, you know, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, that's fine for her. Um, she's Roman Catholic, by the way. I'm sure the Roman Catholic Church is proud to add her statue somewhere next to Joe Biden's, another strong Catholic. I'm just saying. Um, but, but, but here's the thing, is that um, the church has bought into the same thing. Um, I read, in fact, I wrote, yeah, I wrote it down here from, this is from Morgan, yeah, red flag number one, <laughs> Morgan Guyton, it's G-U-I-T-O-N, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but Morgan Guyton, I'm going with that. He's from the United Methodist uh, Church in America, um, and he said, that uh, he said it's the kind, referring to what uh, I just read you from, read you from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, he said it's the kind of theological declaration that I would have mocked as unserious pedestrian liberalism when I was an evangelical. So he's seen the light, probably from his refrigerator. But the beauty of her sincere conviction utterly pierced my heart when I watched her speech. To say that all people are holy is the polar opposite of the core evangelical doctrine that all people are totally depraved by nature. Well, yeah, because the Bible says that. I, we didn't make that up. Um, has he read Jeremiah? Has he read these other passages? I mean, it's kind of, I don't know, you find it once or twice in the Bible? Uh-huh. Uh, and yet, I think it's an absolutely Christian thing to believe, this idea that we are all holy. Now, part of her speech uh, is where, uh, well, these are actually from some tweets from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. 
And she said regarding abortion bans, she said abortion bans aren't just about controlling women's bodies, they're about controlling women's sexuality, owning women. From limiting birth control to banning comprehensive sex ed, U.S. religious fundamentalists, that's us, are working hard to outlaw sex that falls outside their theology. Ultimately, this is about women's power. When women are in control of their sexuality, it threatens a core element underpinning right-wing ideology, patriarchy. It's a brutal form of oppression to seize control of the one essential thing a person should command, their own body. And yet scripture says something different. <laughs> we are not our own. Who owns us? How do we know that? Because it says we were bought with a price. He created us, we're created in his image. These bodies do not belong to us. They're on loan. That's why we're supposed to take good care of them because they don't belong to us. We're supposed, this is called stewardship. And we are to be good stewards of everything that God has given us. The very, the very breath that fills our lungs, the very planet that we live on, we are to be good stewards of it. And so this is at, 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 the, at the core, and I realize that we're kind of, okay, wait, is he talking about race stuff or is he talking about, you know, uh, abortion? or Because they all are tied together. What your understanding is of God versus what Marxism would, would teach. Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but uh, yeah, I know. It happens. So we'll just kind of uh, wrap up with these five underlying principles of Marxism and, and see how these, you know, be thinking this next week. How, how do these, do they agree with the Bible? Do they disagree with the Bible? That's really what it gets down to. Now, if you don't agree that the Bible is God's infallible word, then we have, a, have to have another discussion. But I'm going to assume, for the sake of argument, that we all believe in God's word, that it is true. Um, so these basic principles, the means or mode of production. So again, that's the idea that uh, what, we, what we do is uh, all important, you know, the worker. So means or mode of production is referring, this is where Marx re was referring to the material things necessary to, necessary to produce wealth or products. It includes everything necessary to distribute things with the exception of labor. That's in a different class. Means of production is land, minerals, oil, trees, etc. Distribution is roads, highways, vehicles. Second is historical materialism. And Marx argued that the struggle throughout humanity has always been about production, the means of production. I don't exactly get that, but that's what he said. Um, and all ideology or beliefs are based on that whole system of production. Hegemony. Great word. You can name your next daughter that. Sounds like a Harry Potter character. Um, this is the dominance of one group over the other. And their argument was the bourgeoisie was over the proletariat. Um, and uh, so they, but the way that you change that is through one of two things. Ideology, do we see that happening in the United States? Yeah, or what's the other one? Force, revolution. So when you see people marching in the streets with BLM banners, which is founded on Marxist principles, this is the end game, guys. Now you might think, well, you're overreacting. What did the people think in 1917? Russians literally woke up the next morning in captivity. I mean, their world changed no exaggeration overnight. But things led up to that. And part of it was the failing of the church. The church failed. We're not going to do that. They can burn the building down. Good luck with this concrete monster. <laughs> yeah, when the flames are trying to, you know, envelop the building, it's like, yeah, now make fun of our, ex, our former Costco warehouse church. Fourthly is capitalism, profit, and labor. 
Uh, of course, capitalism, that's considered evil. Um, and then just that whole, their whole emphasis on ideology, the controlling of knowledge. You do realize that for 70 years in the Soviet Union, God was outlawed. He was outlawed. And so, and if they got wind of you, you know, Stalin was ruthless with the Russian Orthodox Church. He leveled the churches. Oh, my goodness. So much more that we need to talk about today, and we're not going to get to that. Well, on that note, here, I'll just leave you with that image. Three of the most evil individuals ever to exist. And we'll talk a little bit about them because it led to other evil individuals. All dead, by the way. Delightful men. Um, but we see what happens when God is not a part of our culture. Don't compromise, ladies and gentlemen. Keep him at the forefront. Keep God's word important. Can I be bold? Pull your kids out of public school, please. <laughs> That's an opinion. Um, but your kids, the next generation, deserve that you need to be right on this. Um, so study his word. Don't take my word for it. Study his word and change your life appropriately. I have to do the same thing for me as well. Well, even though we're running a little bit long, I still, I said that at least until the election, we were going to take time to pray for our country. So if I could have three people that would be willing to volunteer, shoot up your hand. Luis will run the mic to you. And uh, we'll just keep those sh prayers brief. Um, but just praying for our country, just praying for revival, praying for what, you know, the Lord puts on your heart. But, uh, you know, it, it's important, obviously. There's, there's really nothing much more important than praying for the salvation of our friends and neighbors. and.